So today is Wednesday, August 7th, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 186 at block height 589,078. What is cracking today, Rick? Oh man, just trying to uh, reformat the show really quickly before we go live. I did not know, I guess we none of us really knew that we knew Google was planning on getting rid of Hangouts, but we didn't know it was going to happen so abruptly so now we're all here in the mumble and trying to re-situate the show it seems to be going well how are you doing this morning Janine? uh i mean in terms of our show i'm completely on board with the changes we'll have to make to uh how we share the show and you know engagement that we're planning to have with the audience uh but obviously i mean i don't know if we want to discuss that starting off i mean it's pr it's a p pretty big change for certain sections of YouTube, um, especially as Shinobi mentioned, like gamers who make a lot of their money on YouTube by doing live streams and getting tips uh, to answer questions or read comments while they're playing games. So, I mean, I don't think this change will be necessarily bad for us. It'll just make things a bit sticky for the first couple of episodes, but what do you guys think about that? Well, you know me, I like it. I like to roll with the punches. Like every time something changes up, I just think it's a new opportunity to figure out a way to do things differently and see how things shake out. And yeah, I think you're, you know, the things are going to definitely change in some of the structure of the way that people participate with the show. But overall, I think it could be a good thing, a blessing in disguise, something where eventually you get pushed off that cliff. You got to fly sometime. Yeah, I think it'll make it uh, a lot more polished and tighter. But, you know. Nopara, simultaneously, what is going on with you and what are your thoughts on this? I think it's not going to be a good idea to drop the live show because that has a certain kind of magic to it. And it may be very well that very few people are going to watch the show if it's not live. And because of that, I'm going to risk to... <clears throat> drop some gossips here about me stepping down as the CTO of Wasabi and the code maintainer of Wasabi and I finally will be able to have time to get refocused on researching Bitcoin privacy uh, specifically the unequal input mixing and mixing to others instead of mixing to self as it is today so it's very exciting i was trying to get time for this for a very long time now but it just it just gets get farther and farther down the backlog of things to do and uh, i i have to i have to free free up some time for me now uh, but but don't tell anyone because this is not official yet and not announced. <laughs> yeah, don't tell anybody when we put this live on the internet later. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, it's fucking awesome to hear, man. You know, it's, I can definitely get back to uh, picking your brain and, and infecting you with ideas. <laughs> I was thinking that uh, maybe I I have to review a lot of papers because I missed a lot and I got a lot uh, got a lot of papers into my attention that I should have read before and 
probably as I'm reviewing it, maybe the digest will be the place where I'm going to actually present a quick summary on these papers, and that's that's a better way to understand, you know, explaining it. If 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 you think after the few first few uh, present first few summaries, it's still interesting for people, then I will. I would continue to do this. Now it will happen in, I would say, in four months maybe. So it's not a not a thing that's happening right away. I have to do a lot of things like, like giving giving access to people. Right now, if I die, then no one can log into the Wasabi server and things like that. So that's that's not ideal. But gonna gonna fix these these things. Well, yeah, man, teach yourself some well-deserved rest time here every now, like every now and again. I know you've been running the gun since was that August, whenever we, whenever you first released Wasabi, and yeah, things have just been off to the races since then. So yeah, it'll be good to get yourself a little bit of break from that and start refocusing your energy on some other aspects of privacy. Yeah, I just don't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's not tell. Let's keep that secret between all of us. We're good. Uh, so yeah, outside of that, um, I'll just say like real quick that, uh, you know, yeah, I got done with that speech. It went well, and I don't really know that much more about Google that I could really speak about other than I'm in their little intranet of speakers and mentors. We're still see how that goes. I'm still talking to them and yeah, it's about an update with all that stuff. I know I was out for an episode or two, and sorry about that, guys. For y'all, y'all really picked up the slack. I've listened to those episodes; they were good, and I appreciate the help. And you know, it's back to business now. Yeah, I I'm planning to watch that to listen that tonight. Yeah, I'm gonna. I mean, like, I'm gonna re-record it. Like, the recording I have right now, it's sufficient, but it's just not as good as it could be. I could definitely do something better whenever I'm just more calm. I was so nervous that first time giving a speech. It's like I was just almost like rushing through it a little too much. But yeah, let's let's get through this intro, man. We've been introing a little too long. Let's start getting into a little bit about what's going on in this space, man. I mean, we're g jumping right into the crazy here with. Craig Wright and Fatoshi and all that cra craziness? Like, what's going on here? So there uh, was the second hearing with the Craig Wright and Ira Kleiman court case in Florida on August 5th. And we once again had uh, Katie um, Ananina uh, go to the hearing and kind of uh, summarize key points on Twitter as well as uh, he who will not be named, <laughs> who initially was giving in-depth breakdowns, and everybody got very angry with after they realized he was a BSV supporter. But the uh, the the gist of this was uh, mostly a witness uh, testifying. Uh, Steve Shatters, the CTO of Enchain, and if you remember from the original hearing. Um, a lot of Craig's strategy when dealing with um, uh, bullshit or outright fraudulent documents that he had presented to the court was say that other people had compiled this data for him and he had simply been handed this by other people, always offloading the, the blame of sourcing of this information to somebody else. Well, Steve Shatters is the person purportedly who started working to compile air quote uh satoshi slash craig's coins uh public addresses to provide to the court and pretty much how this was done was craig just told him um look for addresses between this date or this date range uh the network launch to august 24 2010 that haven't been spent used pay to public key didn't reuse addresses, uh, had a single output, and only used the value 0 to 58 in the uh, Coinbase nonce field. And he pulled 27,000 addresses from this. And this is effectively the, the basis of Craig uh, 
claiming that the, these are his coins. He, he just threw together some random criteria and had an Enchain employee compile a list of all the addresses or unspent outputs on chain uh, that fulfill this criteria. And this employee started doing this around June 2019. And when asked during uh, this testimony whether he had any conflict of interest in this, um, or any kind of personal interest in the outcome of the trial, he, he answered no. When literally the outcome of this trial and its effect on Craig's claim to have invented Bitcoin literally is going to make or break Enchain, which employs this person. And he claimed in the courtroom that he does not see any personal interest in the outcome of the trial. Um, so the, the next thing that, that Katie went over was a um, Matthew J. Edmond who testified to the altered metadata of the emails purportedly exchanged between David Kleiman and Craig Wright. And pretty much going through just how completely fraudulent most of the information Craig has submitted to the court is. And she specifically points out how frequently the words fraud and fraudulent were used in Mr. Edmund's testimony. And pretty much the, the response was that anybody can alter <laughs> the, the metadata of an email. So once again, this, this strategy of these documents came from somewhere I can't verify and anybody along the way could have altered things to explain why this is just completely bullshit evidence. And again, a, a thing to note is um, Dr. Edmund uh, was a part of the, the Silk Road investigation. So all aspects of, of that aside and the, the issues that's going to create with people's perceptions of this person, the, the important thing to draw from that is that this person is somebody that the court system is going to look at favorably as far as expert testimony regarding things of a technological nature, especially inside the cryptocurrency space. And the, the last thing to note here also is that Craig did not show up for this hearing. So f from what Katie's reported from this, like the, the end chain uh, witness called to testify uh, creates a very, very bad uh, image of the situation as far as Craig is concerned. And then the expert witness brought forward to testify to the fraudulent nature of documents submitted to the court by Craig is somebody that the, the legal system is going to look at as very credible and weight the testimony of very highly given his involvement with the, the prosecution and case against Silk Road. So like this, this is just spiraling further down the fucking toilet bowl uh, as far as Craig is concerned and is absolutely not looking good for a, a favorable outcome for him in this case. As Visek noted a couple of episodes ago, I read a few things about Visek's summary on the Craig Wright case and what, what really happened here is exactly the same. Every time someone brings some document, uh, Craig and his companion is going to is going to claim that document was somehow forged or something happened with the document. Someone modified it ev every time, and <laughs> it's interesting to see they did not give up on that tactic too, because probably they are good at it because they are doing that so 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 many times and such an expert in forging documents that they can figure out how to how to try to disqualify documents they'll say it might be forged because of this and this and this uh, if, if, if you know how to do that then, then you will be good at with this defense too yeah and chain should rebrand themselves as like you know the people that provide the fraudulent documents you need until the court decides to stop playing that game. I mean, you know, this court down there in Florida, I'm pretty sure they've already, you know, heard enough of this nonsense. So I'm curious to see how long that this game keeps getting played before they eventually 
make a ruling on this and maybe eventually, yeah, we'll see some sort of charge come out against uh, Craig Wright. Oh, and, and Chain in general. Shit. Well, I mean, just off the bat, there's perjury and then there's also damages for the theft of intellectual mm -hmm. property from the company that Kleinman owned in Florida. Like, I mean, this, I just, I don't see this not having very negative consequences for Craig, both in the direct legal sense and then also in the, the secondary sense of like the, the, the fallout this is going to have socially for his reputation amongst the the group of suckers who, who still buy all this bullshit. Yeah, I'm poor, just looking at the poor Craig. <laughs> Poor Craig and uh, all of his BSV minions. Like, uh, I don't know, whatever happened to old Mr. Fam. I don't know. I'm looking at the price of BSV, and I know that you guys talked about, you know, the way that they got through a chain split recently. And like we're saying, you know, yeah, now their leaders facing, possibly facing some charges here in the near future. It's just looking a little too crazy over there. It's hard to believe we jumped straight into this crazy. <laughs> but seriously, imagine the stress that Craig is experiencing. I mean, if you have been a fraudster all of your life and things are finally starting to to reach you <laughs> and catch you, and and now it's like, man, how, how can that guy sleep at night? Uh, he he knows exactly what he's doing and that he he knows exactly he cannot do that forever it's it's i don't know poor, poor craig you know <laughs> kevin Iyer's got him on some sort of toxic stew i don't know i mean but just to get like what like, all right like, we'll, we'll, shinobi's gonna put his speculate wildly hat on for a second i mean like we, we keep talking about poor Craig or like this is going bad for Craig, but like what happens when like things really go bad when that's just already happened? Like what happens then? Like what happens when all of these people just finally accept like Craig is a fraud and full of shit? <laughs> like what what happens between like craig and, and calvin is this like a, a complicit thing or is craig duping calvin too like how does a billionaire who is wanted by the u.s government for illegal gambling operations respond to something like that you know what i mean like some of he these things web too. into shady groups of people and very wealthy people who, if they're not in on this scam with Craig, like, how do people usually react in this kind of situation? So, as I see what they are doing, they keep doubling down. And what they are going to do is, well, watch the movie about the drug dealer uh, who was very rich and um, so stupid because I can't recall his name. Uh, but yeah, he, he's just gonna fly. He's just gonna fly somewhere where people cannot find him and live his life uh, with the money that he can spend. He cannot buy jets anymore. He cannot buy boats anymore because he would raise attention, but uh, he will live a fine life. Uh, he, he will fly. They will fly. No power. Yeah. That's not how the world works. That's that's how the world works when somebody looking for you needs legal precedent and permission to come find you somewhere and take you away. Uh, when the person looking for you isn't that type of person, when, when they're potentially more of a criminal or somebody doing illegal things or dancing on that line, um, it's not that easy to just hide from people because when somebody doesn't think they need an official justification to just come and find you and do something to you, they're just going to look for you until they find you and then they're going to do something to you. Who, who are we talking about now? 
who, who well, would be going after him if not the U.S. government? The major corporations, the people involved with it, the the idiots like Calvin, who are all getting sucked into <coughs> Craig's bullshit. That if they are not in on the scam, would be pretty fucking pissed off to finally realize they got scammed. Yeah, it's hard to believe that Calvin Iyer is really, like, that big of a sucker for a bunch of beanie babies. But maybe he is. And, I mean, like, he's the one that's just going to be holding this big bag. But, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, whenever you're in that position, like, you know, Craig is, I mean, you're, like, seriously over leveraged to the point to where you don't really have a place to go. You could try to fly off to some sort of island. They're going to find you. I mean, like, uh, you can't just sort of, like, hurt that many people and expect to just sort of get away from the situation. I think it's the exact opposite. Crack has a very, very high risk tolerance and all of these people know what they are doing. It's just Craig is in the spotlight. Uh, probably not Craig is <laughs> figuring out the next steps, at least not the next reasonable steps. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think they wouldn't go after Craig. Why would they? They are not scammed. They know exactly that Craig is a fraud. They created this fraud. You don't know that. But like that's something we don't know. Well, we do know that the internal politics enough over there to where it's like they all sort of came under the banner of Bcash and Bitcoin Cash and you know, friends with Roger and Jahan, and then it all quickly sort of turned from there and so yeah, we know that these guys aren't exactly the best of friends. Yeah, but Jihan and Roger are not going to hunt down Craig or things like that. They are, they are <laughs> not not those kind of uh, mafioso guys. Well, well I think <laughs> <laughs> that's where I hope. Uh, yeah, I hope he's sort of figured out, plotted all this thing out. Because well, I just don't think he can. But uh, yeah, you want to take us into the next part of this whole. Crazy story, Shinobi? Well, it's not, I wouldn't call it the next part, but uh, I guess the next thing going on in that corner of the woods. Um, I think last episode we talked about the uh, chain split during the Bitcoin SV hard fork. Well, uh, a kind of development um, with that situation uh on the third bitcoin sv somebody mined a 210 megabyte block and this brought down network or nodes down all over the network uh bitmex Research's node went down as well as a large number of other block explorers and you know this goes to show like they had a 128 megabyte block size limit and then increased it again and immediately the next block to take advantage of that increase limit it, it brings down the majority of the network and to really top it off um further developments in this situation highlighted that the split going on from the hard fork is is, is still active so as of the the third when this 210 megabyte block came in um bitmex research uh analyzed the the graph of the sv network um looking at the 420 sv peers they knew about um 40 or no wait sorry 65 percent of them were at the current um tip 17 percent of them were stuck at the 210 megabyte block and 19 percent of them were still on the pre hard fork chain which has apparently progressed by 52 blocks since the fork uh occurred uh, on the 24th so some like relatively small amount of hash rate is still just out there mining it and i mean this this is pretty much a cluster flow like the, this Simultaneously, the, this hard fork and the, this very large block that it enabled had pretty much like fractured the, the Bitcoin SV network in three. 
like 17% of the, the nodes still can't process that 210 megabyte block. It crashed a large number of nodes that received it. Uh, <laughs> a vast majority of the, the nodes on the network um, are, at, or not, not vast majority, maybe a, a little more than a majority are at the current chain. And then you, you still have almost a quarter of it on the pre hard fork chain. Like this is just a clusterfuck. And when you when you look at simultaneously like this kind of technical incompetence and just the 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 groundwork for epic collapse just being laid, you you have all the shit going on with Craig and the Ira climbing case in Florida, and just these two things together are just a disaster waiting to happen for the whole Bitcoin SV ecosystem. I mean, if, if the confidence of Craig's scam falls apart while you have the, the network just technologically falling apart as you try to deliver this this big block pipe dream, like the, the whole ecosystem is just going to collapse under the weight of bullshit. Oh, yeah, this is where I think some of the people that are getting hurt the most might be those guys like Kevin Pham and Daniel Kratowitz. I don't I haven't even really paid much attention to if they're even talking about any of this stuff, because it does seem like there's just so much going on. You can't ignore it. And yeah, all this sort of does add up. And, you know, there's a courtroom with a judge trying to make a, you know, a decision on all this. So all of this information can be factored in and yeah it just doesn't look good for bsv in total kind of curious to see like once this thing absolutely completely implodes however that happens will it still have a price I imagine it still will like you know calvin will still hold some or something whatever it's a it's a wild story to follow yeah i mean <laughs> come on you need no part nothing to toss in on and everything falling apart over there I do, but I might run out of time because I'm trying to find an article of mine where actually Satoshi, I think, said that he's not Craig Wright and didn't get much attention. But uh, yeah, well, I, I will. I will keep keep searching. I don't think that that email really meets the bar of of proof that it was Satoshi. Although I think what it says is true. Oh no! I never. I'm sorry. Never mind. I'm. I'm thinking of the the email posted after uh, the Newsweek and Dorian stuff. Yeah, I think that was a post. What no part was talking about was uh, on Bitcoin Talk. I think, maybe. Any. Let, let me find it because there 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 is a very nuanced circumstances for it, and my conclusion was that it's uh, it was actually real, and this was Satoshi's last appearance. Mm. yeah what, whatever okay but... so it's it's in front of me the title of the post not all post 2011 satoshi appearance has been debunked and what was not debunked is that i am not dorian nakamoto okay this this was one thing uh i, I think we can agree on that 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 was that was probably satoshi that i am not dorian nakamoto okay we can't agree uh anyway <clears throat> i am not craig wright oh shit no sorry guys it it was actually debunked the i am not craig wright we are a satoshi that was that that was uh, that was debunked that was a uh, that email was indeed um, indeed a hoax. So yeah, sorry, I misremembered my conclusion. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's about what we beat up uh, the BSV crowd enough, huh? Yeah, I guess. I think uh, think an old favorite needs to get pulled out uh, as a punching bag for a little bit here, Janine. 
Yeah, some rehash news coming up. What's going on here, Janine? One moment. I'm using uh, two <laughs> computers at the moment. It's a bit hard to scroll. So, um, <laughs> yeah, if you remember back in December 2017, way back when, uh, for episode 65, we talked with Bill and Jack Mallers about the circumstances under which Coinbase added buy and sell support for Bcash. And so shout out to Bitcoin Mom for the reminder on Twitter that I saw. Um, that's why I covered this. And so since March 2018, there's been a class action lawsuit regarding that uh, dispute, um, which is called Jeffrey Burke versus Coinbase. And it's happening in the Northern District of California. And on August 6th, so that was two days ago, there was an order signed by the judge presiding over the case that denied Coinbase's motion to compel arbitration. And one of the other paragraphs that Bloomberg particularly latched onto uh, was a paragraph from that order, uh, which is document 75 in the docket um, on page four, where the judge says the following. The complaint also lays out a plausible account that Coinbase breached its duty to maintain a functional market. For starters, the fact that Coinbase halted trading within three minutes of the launch is indicative of dysfunction. The buyers have also identified precautions Coinbase could have taken to avert the massive spike in the price of Bitcoin Cash on its exchange. Most prominently, Coinbase could have announced its launch of trading in Bitcoin Cash more than an hour in advance, which would have permitted more buyers and sellers to place limit orders. That way, Coinbase could have ensured the liquidity and market capitalization needed for the or needed needed for an orderly market. Coinbase instead launched trading uh, while only purchase orders were pending, and the buyers have alleged a plausible motive for Coinbase's seemingly rushed decision to launch under subpar conditions. The, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange opened trading in Bitcoin futures the day before the launch. So that is uh, quite interesting. That is basically what we were talking about a very long episode back in December 2017, and now that it is... Uh, seems to be the conclusion that the judge is reaching. According to uh, Bloomberg, uh, Coin uh, Coinbase did not respond to their request for comment about the lawsuit at the time, and I didn't see any tweets about it on social media either, so this is quite an interesting development. And if you want to look at all the documents that are publicly available and continue to follow the class action, you can find a link to the docket um, court listener in the video description. Another thing I want to add is that unrelated to the lawsuit, Coinbase tweeted on August 5th that, quote, over time we expect Coinbase customers around the world will have access to at least 90% of the aggregate market cap of all digital assets in circulation which, if I'm interpreting that right, means that Coinbase basically wants to be running the infrastructure for 90% of digital assets in circulation, which is not at all a positive prediction in my view. Uh, <gasps> the stupid goal. Here is a system that's completely decentralized and censorship resistant and so on, and let's just centralize it and... <laughs> sensor it I don't know like what the hell are they even thinking I mean they are building on top of something that if they have so much power they have to be responsible for the success for it and they just don't care oh yeah Coinbase is just yeah it's really confusing because I mean for sure they've definitely got a large share of the market and you know people use them but I mean like the stuff that they do technically and their engineering and the way that they handle the infrastructure of Bitcoin and these systems that they want to help promote it's uh it's really ridiculous and they're they're a laughing stock behind the scenes that's where it's like you really have two different groups of people that sort of way on both sides of this scale that coinbase is on it's like uh you know you have the engineers on one side and you know the speculators and investors on the other and somehow they keep moving forward with the regulators and yeah it's just a floating monstrosity something's got to change over there brian get out of there man well, i mean you know i'm just happy to see like this decision made because it's just unbelievable like that whole situation is so obviously fraudulent 
I mean, like, it, it was clearly a situation crafted to try to intentionally pump uh, B Cash. I mean, like, hands down. Like, Brian personally and so much of that company has just been, like, hard fork crazy for years, like, since the company was founded. And it's so obvious. And then the whole investigation of themselves that concluded no insider trading occurred like that's horseshit like i hang out in trading groups i trade i literally had people i know personally a day before the launch was announced and happened telling me it was going to happen by this like i know whole communities of traders that were trading off of insider knowledge from Coinbase that leaked, that was leaked out, that factually happened. And just the idea that they just go, nope, we investigated ourselves, we didn't do nothing, move along, is batshit crazy. Like, yeah. this will go to court now, this will go to trial, this will get investigated. Like, awesome. I yeah, that's don't weird. Really, Sorry, go ahead, Nupur. I don't really want to get into this argument again with you, but I don't think I have second thoughts about if insider trading is bad, but I am absolutely sure that this cannot be enforced in a just fair way, uh, whoever is doing that. And everyone is doing that. Dude, I don't care about that. It's the claims that it didn't happen when it factual. I know, I personally know 100% for a fact it happened. I witnessed it myself. And they claim that it didn't. Like, that's unacceptable. All right. Like if they want to play so ball, go ahead. if if they want to play ball in government regulation land, where they try to push and impose that on this ecosystem as a whole, so that they can exist and make money, then they can exist and play by the rules of government regulation. Deal with it. Yeah, it's good to see at least some action taken against that because, like you're saying, it was pretty blatant. Anybody there around the time floating around certain channels knew about that. And, yeah, if you can just look at the charts and everything, you can see it too. It's uh, it's pretty evident. So, yeah, it'll be good to see. Maybe, you know, they'll actually start to yeah, change some of their positions and, you know, do some things right. I mean, they were really kind of frightened whenever that all launched because I remember it was like, I don't know, it was big news at the time where before it was like, who gives a crap about what's going on at some crypto exchange? But whenever that happened in late 2017 and it was all this money, then it became a big deal. You reap what you sow. Ding, all right, ding, ding. I think I'm going to go into the next story. And I just find, I, I don't really report on this kind of news, but I found this interesting that Apple Card will not allow purchase of cryptocurrencies. <clears throat> the Apple Card customer agreement said the card cannot be used for purchase of cash advances or cash equivalents that include cryptocurrencies, casino, gaming, chips, race, truck, wagers, or lottery tickets, or terrorists. So what are your initial thoughts on this so far? Well, Is Apple banning Bitcoin? No, I mean, it's like, dude, they're extending you credit. I mean, it is what it is. Like, you know, I mean, you know, what, what really bothers me and what, what, when these types of things, like, you know, credit cards banning shit happens, is the idea of card processors banning it or like people preventing you from using your debit card with your own cash to buy something. But I mean, ultimately, as, as much as it, it might suck if you want to use it for that, it, it's it's credit. Like somebody else is lending you their money. Yeah, you just ruined my follow-up. 
I, I wrote it to myself. Let Shinobi to rant about it, then turn the tape. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> nah, fuck that. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's it. It's it's a credit card, not a debit card. <laughs> it's their money, and you borrow it. <laughs> they just want to ensure that you pay it back. And Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are risky investments, and. Bitcoin is actually a gateway to a much bigger, much riskier investment, which is called shit coins. So See, you just yeah. fucked up. <laughs> You're too smart. <laughs> you just fucked up. You could have just flipped it on me and been like, you know, they should they should encourage people to buy Bitcoin with it because then when Bitcoin moves, they know they'll get paid back. You just fucked up, dude. You could have flipped it on me. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Okay, okay, guys, that that, that was it. Uh, we can move on to the next story. You see through right away. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, I guess next up is uh, Square Cash has posted their uh, second quarter shareholder letter, and. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, so, I mean, first off, let's just look at the, their overall revenue. Um, it has grown to $1.17 billion from $959 million, uh, last quarter. And, you know, it's seen a, a lot of specific growth um obviously in bitcoin but really the what what i want to look at here is not just the growth of bitcoin sales um i, I want to look at like the the internals of really how cash app is starting to develop in, in terms of their their internal revenue and how customer use of the product is really making them money and the the six different revenue sources they have right now are like fees from instant deposits uh cash card business accounts um the peer-to-peer -peer transactions so like just sending each other money through uh cash app directly bitcoin and then interest on um people's fiat balances when they hold it in a bank but the interesting thing I want to look at here with uh, Cash App specifically is overall its revenue is almost half Bitcoin. So the, the, the Cash App is generating $260 million this quarter and $125 million of that is Bitcoin. So that's 135 million for fees and um, other things from uh, fiat use, and then 125 million from Bitcoin revenue. So like Square Cash overall has been just a growing payment app on different platforms. Like the company's been growing overall, but when you really pull out the app itself and you look at what's making the money from the app like half of their money maker is bitcoin so just this kind of not bitcoin only like payments business that's exploding in growth is making almost half of their payments app money from people buying and selling bitcoin and just like step back and think for a second about where this company is versus companies like Coinbase or Kraken that are just crypto companies that people are not going to seek out for any other purpose. And think about how fast this, this business that's core business is not really cryptocurrencies. It's just general digital fiat payments and how much of this company's growth is being driven by Bitcoin. Like that that's kind of nuts and just kind of like showing the the potential here for bitcoin really to start plugging into 
more mainstream things like this and really offer people that kind of route to interact with it as opposed to just download this this pure bitcoin wallet like we're dealing with right now and like that potential is, is fucking huge yeah square cash man the cash app's really done i mean good stuff right there as far as just you know creating something that bitcoiners can use and people that just want to you know dip their toes in the space feel comfortable with and I mean, yeah, it makes sense that they're making money because, I mean, like, look what happened with Overstock. You know, you talk about companies that dip their toes into the space and you got a company like Overstock where all of a sudden their holdings in Bitcoin became worth so much that it basically created an entire new wing of their business where now they actually have been starting to create their own token and exchange and all this stuff where, yeah, I mean, businesses that are stepping into this space are going to make a good amount of money because... You know, those that are doing it right, it's few and far between. And, you know, yeah, the Cash App's doing it pretty well. I mean, I've been using it fairly recently and haven't really run into too many hangups. So it's good to see that, you know, yeah, they're making money and hopefully other businesses will start to take note and, you know, keep moving in. Well, I just mean it's like just really like the, the situation technologically is so so early and immature with Bitcoin. And there's just this perception that it, it can't handle if everybody rushes in and tries to use it right now. And like, that's just wrong. Because I mean, like, look at, like, look at what Square Cash is doing with Cash App. I mean, like, they're literally like building a whole ecosystem like there there is no reason at all abstractly why instead of seeing dollars when i open this app and look at like sending money to people through the app i just see bitcoins too like if if things stampede like those kind of ecosystems will get built and they will be able to handle a lot of shit because frankly most people are comfortable with that where people like us aren't and like that's just look at the money dynamics here too with where cash apps revenue is coming from like that's not crazy that's not like oh my god amazon just started accepting bitcoin like they're they're making money integrating bitcoin right now like half of their revenue like what happens when they take that a step further? Yeah, I mean, I'm ready to see it, man. I'm ready to see because, yeah, I mean, technologically, we were able to do it. The only thing I'm thinking is like, of course, immediate thing I'm going to run into is people on the ground. They're like, yeah, I bought this Bitcoin, but these fees are crazy. And it's like, well, it's because, you know, right now everybody's buying Bitcoin because of something that just happened. But yeah, I mean, like, uh, you know, they're working closely with, you know, I mean, they've hired core developers and they're working closely with Lightning Network stuff. I mean, they're technologically moving in that direction to handle these things. But yeah, my first thought is like if right now everybody rushed to go buy Bitcoin, I imagine the fees would be pretty much like the main thing I'd be talking to people about. The new people coming in wondering like, OK, well, I got this thing and it worked, but now how come I'm paying this? Yeah, but it's my point. Even with like really streamlined functional like layers and ways to transact on top of it, like if if a company like Square took Cash App and just built Bitcoin PayPal into it, like that would get huge use and adoption, and that network effect kickoff would just leapfrog it. And I mean, it's you know I I like this company. I like the on-ramp they built and the functionality they built. And, you know, I don't see anything that makes me think that they're going to be a malicious actor in the near term. But, I mean, ultimately, like, companies that start building products like this are going to keep iterating and moving that forward. And that naturally extends into, like, oh, this 
build a PayPal ecosystem on top of this, like so to say. Yeah, I mean, like before this, uh, really, the only thing we were seeing was models like what Robinhood and, uh, you know, Coinbase, where there was like online places to purchase Bitcoin. And, you know, yeah, it just really wasn't like a, such an easy app to interface with. And so, yeah, they're showing us it's possible. I mean, yeah, I, I really like the company, too. I mean, like I've talked to Jack about this deposit thing. And I mean, I don't know. It's just... Uh, you know, it is a little scary just because they are such a big company. But I mean, as long as they're progressing things in the direction that it's like the whole community kind of wants to move in this direction, it's like even if they make a bad decision, we know how that goes. I mean, like another company will come up and, you know, take their lunch. So it should all be great for the space. It's just like moving everything forward. Well, no, but I mean, it's like, can you just say like that's a bad thing? if they build a product like that and people want to use it and they use it like can you can you just say that's bad like you know what i mean like i i know i know like that ultimately this story is just this simple like you're talking about a person no you're talking I'm just, about a I'm saying, of the like, network. Is, is people doing something that they want to do but you wouldn't want to do bad like can you tell should you be able to tell them like don't do that no. that's bad because i mean ultimately no. like you know like i said this ultimately the story is just the shareholder letter but it's like really think about where not just pure bitcoin companies that start integrating bitcoin stuff like are really going to go in the long term like you know i mean as like lightning is awesome like liquid is awesome like the potential for things like chami and ecash is awesome but i mean just realistically i think the first way you're gonna see people really widely transacting with bitcoin is more likely through things like a cash app ecosystem like for most people like well they trust companies more than lightning or liquid and bitcoin it's just simpler, easier. It's what they're used to. And like they'll pay for that and a company will make money for providing that. Yeah, I mean, like we've said, you know, I mean, um, these Bitcoin banks are going to be a real thing. And I mean, it's one of the reasons Coinbase has got so much success right now. But um, yeah, it's like a, it's a little bit of a risk there whenever you're talking about percentages of the network that operate on that sort of thing. Like you definitely don't want that to be a large percentage of the network that operates that way. But like you're saying, I don't know if we can really help that. Um, might just have to, you know, keep uh, iterating to solve that problem before it actually gets here. Well, I mean, in, uh, last thing I'll say, because I will just keep rambling forever on this is like you know when we see ecosystems like this get built i mean there is the potential for them to be interoperable they're all just tracking bitcoin and i mean any company providing an ecosystem like that can link in with other ecosystems like that is possible with bitcoin so i mean it's not it's not like it it's not like it's required to be a completely walled garden that can't interact with other things. Well, that's good. Just to like Microsoft, right? <laughs> oh my God, shut up, fanboy. All right, Janine, you're up. Wait, I thought Apple was the walled garden. <laughs> they both are walled gardens. Yes, no, that was my point. I mean, you have a fucking Linux kernel in your Windows. Okay, not yet, but it's just a click from the Microsoft Store and you can use it. And... Yeah, inside of Microsoft's <laughs> walled garden. Exposed uh, yeah. to everything should... the walled garden is. I, I should stop now because we lose all of our audience. <laughs> Microsoft is a walled garbage bin. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> in the past 
One second. No! Second done. Talk now. <laughs> So, sorry about that. In the past several weeks or so, um, you may have seen some dire predictions about how the Zcash Foundation developing the Zcash protocol is going to run out of money, or not specifically the foundation, but rather the whatever development effort is going to run out of money, because their first happening is scheduled to occur in October 2020, and the Zcash Founders Award will end at that point as was originally decided. So on July 31st, uh, Zuko published a letter from his Medium account to address the, quote, intense conversation that was initiated by people in the Zcash community. And Zuko, as the CEO of the electric Electronic Coin, co I can't remember if it's Electric Coin or Electronic Coin, but like ECC, it. yeah, says that... Um, as the CEO, he hopes that, quote, the community will decide to renew the dev fund structure allocating coins from future block rewards for core support functions such as software development, user support, business development, regu regulatory, and government outreach. Oh, boy. Um, security, that was inserted comment for me. Uh, security auditing and monitoring, educational and marketing initiatives, new protocol development, and so forth. And I hope... The community offers to High Electric Coin Company to do that work, aka me, Zuko. And uh, he then goes through in his post the history of Zcash as far as he remembers it and how uh, it got approved by regulators and got listed on Gemini and got listed on Coinbase, even though neither of those exchanges allow you to actually use Zcash's privacy features outside of their plat uh, inside their platforms, which is the whole reason for Zcash's existence in the first place, but yada yada. Um, he also talks about how Zcash survived the bear market of 2018 by not laying people off, but negotiating a dilution agreement with the founding investors uh, because they were supposed to get a portion of the founder's reward as well. And one thing he mentions that I was not aware of uh, is this. He says, ECC is currently the owner of the trademark on Zcash, the Golden Z logo, and so on in a lot of different countries. We've talked about the Zcash Foundation um, entering into some sort of power sharing agreement with ECC on the use of the trademark, but as long as, we're, as long as we are the sole owners of the trademark, we can support the process by using the trademark to compel exchanges and other third parties to use the name Zcash only for things that honor the community's collective decision. That is probably the most important uh, couple of sentences in this entire post because earlier on, I think in the post, he, he claims at one point that he, Zuko, does not have power over the decisions of the foundation. He's like, it's a separate entity from me, blah, blah, blah. But... Sure, you, you're not in the foundation, but as the CEO of the Electric Coin Company, the owner of the Zcash trademark, you have the legal power to shut down any use of the Zcash brand, including a fork coin that might want to call itself Zcash in the event of a, of a network split. That would be quite awkward and kind of uh, doesn't support your claim that you don't have power in this decision. And so he then continues, if you own any Zcash, if you are a developer or entrepreneur who uses or is considering using Zcash, if you are a supporter and advocate for a better alternative for your society, then your voice has value in this conversation. There are plenty of public threads happening on the forum, the community chat, Reddit, Twitter, Medium, etc. that you could join. If you are not comfortable speaking up in public, or even if you are, please also send email to governance at z.cash telling us what you think, and we will read all emails sent there, anonymize you, and report to the rest of the community what you told us. So, um, this is another pro problematic part of the letter, and I can't, I, like, it, it boggles my mind that they actually think that this is, is acceptable. So, when I read this conclusion, I immediately noticed, uh, and you might too, especially if you're in Bitcoin, I immediately noticed that at no point in the letter does Zuko used the word nodes. Nowhere. At all. Uh, so, my question is, how many of the so-called community members who are running nodes um, 
Like, do they have any, like, specific say? Like, why is this decision being made through messaging a single central email account and not, why is it not a choice that is made by individual nodes that are, uh, you know, to follow a particular chain and ensuring that the Zcash network fun functions? Why is, why is this a conversation that's happening over email? Why is it a decision that is happening through some kind of report by the Zcash? I don't, he doesn't even specify whether the email address is for the Zcash Foundation or the Zcash uh, company, otherwise now known as Electric Coin Company. So, like, I just don't understand. Why, why is this not a decision being made by nodes? Or is this another chain where nodes aren't important? Decentralization makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. Yay! Yeah, this sounds like because uh, I don't want to use the word fork, and we're just going to call them upgrades. It's like all the decision making comes out of through that through that office where supposedly he doesn't have any control, like you say. It's really a lot of mental gymnastics and um, contortionist um, maneuvers. Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, do, I mean, really just boil it down. Zuku is just another one of those idiots out there who wants to have like a coin that pays the money that they control to pay for their shit and just be able to call it decentralized. <laughs> and it's, uh, for some reason, the cognitive dissonance required to believe that seems to be, uh, viral and contagious. Yeah, I just, I really can't get over that sentence where he says that that the um, ECC can support the process, like the decision-making process, by using the trademark to compel exchanges and other third parties to use the name Zcash only for things that honor the community's collective decision. I just find, like, he's he's basically framing a dangerous point of centralization as a good thing. As a, support, as a support, as a support, as a support system. Yeah, well, I mean, it's um, not a smart man. Um, we'll just say that uh, first. And uh, I would just like to say publicly now that if if this actually happens and the the, the developer tax is reinstated, I move to call it the grocery tax uh, from this point on. <laughs> it's it's yeah. a tax to pay for Zuku's trips to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that was another... So there was a portion of his post, I think at least twice, where he was talking about how... It was a very strange sense. It was like, I, I gave or I donated half of the wealth that I ever expected to this project and invested it in, you know, making the Zcash foundation in addition to other investors. And then later on in the post, he says that the value of that wealth that he was referring to was the Zcash coins, which were worth nothing, obviously, when it launched and then the price went up. So he's saying that he risked wealth in the form of coins that had no value <laughs> bro do you know how much risk was involved in me just printing this money out of thin air and giving it to or half of it to somebody who wasn't me i mean like seriously guys like that's some real skin in the game like how do you not see that Like, really, guys, I'm like, I'm disappointed at, at your emotional maturity to just disregard that huge personal risk I took in, in yes. giving away half this money I printed out of the So to quote specifically, he says, I, at the founding of the Zcash Foundation, I pledged to donate more than, more or less that's a weird sense. I pledge to donate more or less half of all of the wealth I ever expect to see in this world to create the Zcash Foundation. We decided to do this because we thought having an independent entity from the elect 
electric coin company would be an important part of Zcash, the Zcash community's decentralization and dis, uh, stability in the long run. Having two independent organizations working for you is a lot more resilient than having one. Oh, good. I, I'm glad we made that important step. Therefore, we made the Zcash Foundation wholly independent and of and outside of my control. And then let me see, where is the second reference to? It's the two mentions of wealth. Later on, he says, for example, remember when I said I pledged more or less half of all the wealth I ever expected to see in the world to found the Zcash Foundation? Well... I did that, but you know what? Those coins were worth nothing at the time. So in sense, in a sense, I pledged half of nothing. That's, that's literally what he writes. I pledged half of nothing. What? I don't know. Zuku's such um, a character. They potential. Potential, yeah. What the? Okay, like, Zuko is an alien because... <clears throat> yeah, Zoku has to be an alien because just no human being can be or possess that little self-awareness. I mean, yeah, like, you know, he's someone here locally. I just, as, like I've said this before, I've run into him. He definitely is a character, man. He's like one of these guys that kind of mumbles to himself a little bit and... You know, he's kind of always got his hair some which direction because he's trying to think about 10 different things. I don't know why people put so much faith in him. I mean, I definitely think he's just like one of these characters where people see something and they're like, oh, there's there's some genius behind this craziness. But I think he's really just crazy. Yeah, very, very real possibility. He then goes on to say that the value of the issuance comes from the coin holders, but yeah. <laughs> so everybody holding Zcash, they like really believe in privacy enough to where they uh, purchase Zcash, but don't understand that it really doesn't provide any level of privacy. Also, uh. I, I guess the, the unspoken implication is that because the Zcash price has dropped by, what, 80% since the launch price? That means there are fewer coin, fewer coin holders, or the coin holders value Zcash less since it uh, came about? Is that the, <laughs> is that the unspoken <laughs> admission? That's, that's what the market's saying. All of this is costing his bills, man. He needs some taxes. He's got groceries to buy, dude. Grocery tax. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess any more uh, toss around on uh, Zoku? Any jokes? Any dunks? Yes, I just want to say that uh, in Wasabi, we just hired a guy who's 21 years old and he's a programmer and I have no idea where he got that knowledge while he's so young and this is his first job and he knows stuff I don't. I very, very rarely talk about, I, I, I don't believe geniuses exist, but this guy from the Philippines, Jumar, really seems to be a genius. So my point is that you should give me your money because we have a genius in the house. <laughs> nice pitch. Nice pitch. Also, I, I just, I really hope that they don't lose access to the pin or the password for whatever or whoever is running this Zcash email account that they're using to make governance decisions. Dun dun dun! Because you know that would be that would be tragic if that got lost, and then oh my god, we'd have to rely on the nodes to make decisions. Dun dun dun! All right, so we kicked this one to death. I think we kicked this one to death. Yep. All right. Alrighty then, it is time to talk about fun stuff. 
coin join civil attacks. So Chris Belcher, uh, actually it was a little, a little bit ago, uh, July 25th posted an idea to the Bitcoin dev mailing list <clears throat> to address civil attacks, uh, in join market using fidelity bonds. Uh, just to kind of like rough over things here, like when, when you're talking about join market, it's different than a mixer like Wasabi or Samurai who are both using a centralized mixer to coordinate things. And so when you're talking about civil attacks, what this pretty much means is in the case of a centralized mixer, that mixer can do things to deal with civil attacks and prevent them from happening. But that server itself can civil attack any coin join that it wants. Now with something like join market, um, you know, it, it's a lot more market based and in order to try to civil attack everything, there is an economic cost to try to guarantee that you're going to mix with enough of everything to be able to de-anonymize it. So you, you need enough Bitcoins to constitute um, a significant enough amount of the coins out there willing to mix to be involved in everything. Now, the, the, the kind of problem that join market is facing right now is that it's not really growing in terms of liquidity that much. Um, in 2016, there was a paper looking at the cost to civil attack join market and put it at around $32,000 um, to perform an attack that would succeed 90% of the time. And you get the money back afterwards because you're just mixing with it. And the increase in join market liquidity since then really only increases that cost two or three times. So at most it's, it's around maybe a hundred thousand dollars to civil attack, uh, join market and break the anonymity of the coin joints. And so considering you get that back, I mean, that's very possible. And so, Part of the, the reasoning here, they think that the liquidity is not growing is, is two reasons. One, there's enough liquidity really to, to mix anything. Like there, there's enough liquidity on join market to make coin joins that have outputs of 400 Bitcoin each. So there's not really a need for liquidity in order to mix more or higher amounts. And also people are hesitant to have more amounts of Bitcoin on a hot wallet on a network computer, which you need to do for a coin join. And so the idea here with a fidelity bond is that you could either burn by sending to an op return address some amount of Bitcoin or time lock some amount of Bitcoin in order to kind of put like a weighted stake. And the idea is you, you would value these bonds um, burning or time locking differently, obviously, but in a way that you could <clears throat> kind of have this high value at stake without having it on a network machine and also raise the cost of a Sybil attack. And pretty much the idea is like you, if you burn, um, let's say point um, zero zero one, or if you burn 0 0.01, like that's equivalent um, to say like a hundred Bitcoin time locked for a year. And so you have a very big skew where um, it takes a lot more Bitcoin locked up in a time lock to represent some being burned permanently. Or, I'm sorry, it's a uh, hundred Bitcoin to 0 0.1 being burned. And so you would weight these and people would prefer to use um, a couple of different uh, makers on the join market who have <clears throat> bonds with very high costs. And you could do this to really raise the, the cost of a civil attack at the expense of kind of making 
the coin joins more expensive in terms of fees because the makers have to kind of make up for either burning or time locking coins and not being able to make money with them somehow um, in order to do this kind of bond system. But this would, you know, allow you to have, um, you know, the ability to time lock a, a UTXO and then sign a key with that to prove that you've delegated this, this other key. And then you now have a, a hot key you can use to prove that you have this bond and that uh, use that to coordinate the coin joins and kind of make the the civil resistance of join market uh, a lot more robust just because of this dynamic going on with uh the lack of continuing liquidity build up and the, the relatively low cost of sibling things right now and so i think this this would really be an interesting way to kind of uh, address that issue that join market is having that that things like wasabi or samurai don't really have to to really take into account or, or consider like with them it's it's just do you trust the the server or not so um yeah i guess uh no para particularly like what are you what are your thoughts on, on this kind of setup and how this could work yes definitely so at first i was confused why are hey, you no para civil attacks Oh, you can't can hear me? Yeah, there, there, that's better. So, what, what's, what's better? <laughs> I didn't do anything. Uh, get, get a little closer can, can to the mic. Can you hear me now? Is it good? It's a little, mind. it's a little quiet. So, and what if I talk louder, like this? Get closer. <laughs> <laughs> it's up louder. Is it it's good quieter. Or not good. It's okay or not good. Okay. You you just sound like you're far away from the mic. Uh, even now. There we go. No, you're good. That's you're good. better. That's better. Okay, uh, it makes more sense. I have to sit down. Okay, <clears throat> so the thing is, I was confused. Why are you talking about civil attacks here? Because I thought this fidelity. Uh, bonds thing is, is all about those attacks, denial of service attacks. Uh, because I did not read what Patcher just published, uh, because I will get back to that in a moment. Why? So, what, yeah, yeah, so, so what is a civil attack and what is a DOS attack? A civil attack is in a coin join when multiple participants actually one part, one. There is only one single entity behind multiple participants in a coin join or many participants. I don't know what would constitute as a successful civil attacks. If if there are two honest participants, then that's still mixing. Anyway, this is the civil attack. The DOS attack, the denial of service attack, is when um <clears throat> so in coin joins people have to sign the inputs and if you don't see the output in the transaction is in the common transaction that you built together with other people then uh, your input then you're not gonna sign your input now this is good because you cannot lose money with it so this is awesome but on the other hand if someone just decides to not sign that input then it denial of service attacks the ser the service now what I just realized a few moment, moments ago is that in CoinJoin, it doesn't really matter uh, if it does or Sibyl. The attacker has a choice to do. Uh, why? Because in, in Join Market, I hope I said Join Market, not CoinJoin before. In Join Market, uh, you actually, anyone who's participating in a transaction know, knows all the links. So, which doesn't really matter in join market because join market is about small, quick uh, coin joins, but they know the links. Uh, and why this is important is because if an attacker gets there to Sibyl attack or DOS attack, so attacker could either choose to refuse to sign the transaction or can choose to sign the transaction and uh, 
no one's gonna figure out that hey uh the attacker um i was actually a spying peer because it doesn't have to get into most of the peers it has to get into one peer but there are a lot of small coin join transaction so what that research was about is that how much money do you need to get into many of join market transactions uh I don't think you can get into most of the joint market transactions uh, in an economical way, but I'm not sure about that. But but the point is that this is how much money you would need to denial of service attack and to Sibyl attack because the attacker have a choice to make, hey, do you want to DOS attack or Sibyl attack? Okay, uh, why I'm bringing DOS attack here now is that because actually Chris Batcher in 2017 when I did my zero link research uh, he that's when he got this idea he commented under the DOS defense issue in zero link so th this actually uh, applies to that and I will read what he said then I was reading the Google Docs document and thought of another way to make the DOS more costly, which is to use Fidelity Bond. I used the idea when thinking about anti-DOS for coin swap, but didn't use that name. And I want to concentrate on the negatives of it. Uh, in terms of, I'm not sure there are yeah, there are negatives in joint market too. The the real problem with th this is great because this seems to be a really sure way to stop the denial of service attack because the attacker won't have enough money. Uh, what he said there is that it doesn't rely on high minor fees like simply banning UTXOs. But it does mean the user need to own more bitcoins than they intend to mix. Uh, for example, to mix one bitcoin, they need to own 1.5 bitcoin if the fidelity bond is for 0 0.5 bitcoin. Uh, and my response was to that is unfortunately, fidelity bonds would require the user to have more money in its wallet than it can mix. Uh, which ruins the user experience, but also it would result in longer rounds if we assume non-zero confirmations of these fidelity bonds. Uh, however, what I really like about this is that it, it doesn't need to have some mental gymnastics. I mean, if you think through how you can how you can dosata wasabi, it's it's not hard. It sorry. It's, it's pretty fucking hard because there are a couple of protections in place, but it's hard. And if someone figures out, we still have this safety net to fall back into using f fidelity bonds uh, because this, this can't really be, this, this can't really be just, just, yeah, it's hard to overcome this too. So this is how I think about uh, this whole scheme is to as a safety net uh, to and I'm, I don't have an expert opinion if in joy market this is the right way to go. I think Batcher is making the right decision so I will just go with that and believe him that okay in joy market this would be the right way to go. And it has some different characteristics than any other thing. But I mean, like, it's there's really nothing else <clears throat> you can do with this situation where liquidity is not growing because there's enough to mix. And I mean, ultimately, like, it's market based. Like, it's it's simple. Like, anybody who's a maker who uses a fidelity bond will charge higher fees to make up for the coins they locked. And people in the market will either pay for that or they won't. Join market is kind of Sibyl and DOS resistant. Not 
perfectly. But it's, it's but not though. By that's, that's why he's he's that's why he is doing the whole fidelity bond proposal. Like he was looking at a paper from 2016, and it would only cost thirty two thousand dollars to Sybil attack join market because the the it's not that much liquidity and it's only grown like two or three times in liquidity. So that's like a hundred thousand dollars to Sybil attack join market with a 90% success rate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was my point. Just a different tone that you need $30,000 to Sybil attack join market. That's uh, not a lot. Just dude. by, by design, because you but, have but to no part that's like nothing that's nothing that's like a, a fucking chain analytics company could do that instead of paying one like fucking office assistant salary yeah I, i'm not arguing that it is a perfect solution i'm just saying that it has this going for uh just right out of the box uh you know which, yeah, but my which, point which is, is pretty that's good. not enough because liquidity isn't really growing fast. And like that, that natural civil resistance doesn't work unless liquidity grows fast. And it's not really doing that. So like that's like you need something like this fidelity bond or like I can just go, I'm going to civil attack all join market instead of pay one developer. And that's something every chain analysis company out there could do we implement join market two of two transactions to wasabi and liquidity will grow <laughs> like there are ways to get liquidity you know uh but, but again i'm not arguing that this this economical cost is a is a perfect way i i don't know if if it's a good way maybe maybe not i i don't know but it's it's a it's a, it's an okay way so far but if we if he has something else figured out then that's that's even better right uh well, i mean that's I'm, the beauty of i don't like market. the user experience uh, uh, like well, it's okay. a market like it, this all literally can just get thrown out there and then the market uses it or not like you just you implement the bond software to make them and then you implement like options to let users prefer them in the wallet and then the market does its thing and this works or not. And like really any kind of kind of change like this in, in join market, like that's it's all market dynamics. Like it, the market adopts it or it doesn't. No, I just figured out what I'm mix, missing uh, and it makes perfect sense now. Uh, why I didn't want it to to add it to the zero link research to get into Wasabi later because it ruins the user experience of Wasabi users because they will have to have more money than how much they can mix. But in join market, it's not the case because normal users are only takers. They are only market takers. Well, if you are not using the tumble function, then you are only taker. And the market makers are actually the ones who are running the yield generator. So they, they are, it doesn't ruin their user experience because their user experience is to keep running a thing and uh, it's gonna do the mixing by, yeah. by itself. But, and then the yeah, user so wallets, th that's they just, yeah, they, the user just says like whether they want to prefer a fidelity bond with a higher fee or not. And then it just it does its thing. Yeah, so now I agree that this is this is a this is a good solution for giant markets. I'm sure about it. Mm -hmm. So this is this is fucking woohoo Yeah. Yeah in, indeed. And if mm -hmm. here's here's the here's the thing too. If we can convince them to finally make a GUI that isn't a fucking hellscape of a Electrum plugin that is a nightmare, then people would finally have a wallet that they can time lock things with. Fringe benefit. I will say they actually do have, and I've seen a demo 
of it in Malta a couple of months ago and uh, it, it, it works. It works and uh, I don't know what it needs, but Joy Market has information scattered all over the internet and if someone's trying to use it, he's not gonna find the GUI. But it it there is actually a GUI and it works. So uh, man, it just I don't know what it needs, but some some more I don't know. Yeah, organized more organized BFX scene information about Joy Market. Uh, more hey here is the Joy Market website. This is download GUI and use Joy Market. That's that's the only thing it needs. Uh, yeah, it's I'm a big fan of Joy Market. <laughs> by the way, all true. We salute you. But I guess uh, unless there's anything more, we want to slide along to the next one. Well, let's go to the next one. Yeah, let's just do this. We're going to change pace a little bit, going from all this computer science and technical stuff. We're going to dip down into the fundamentals of economics again and geopolitics and all that. So, all right. Well, there's been an important piece of news recently that definitely relates to Bitcoin and the long term outlook for Bitcoin and macroeconomics. And I'm talking about the Federal Reserve recently lowering interest rates. Actually, this is the first time they've lowered interest rates since the financial crisis of 2008 and Bitcoin's inception. The interest, oh no, hold up. Sorry, I gotta like a, you know, resituate the notes and everything for this new broadcast. So, all right, back to it. Interest rates before the crisis of 2008 was hovering just over 5%. It then fell all the way down to near 0% for the better part of a decade. But in late 2015, the Fed decided to start raising interest rates again slowly, growing up to 2.25% to 2.5% just earlier this year. Now, the rates have been cut back down to 2 to 2.25%, which might not seem like much, but the signal of the, that signal is a big turnaround. Now, real quickly, these lower interest rates will give borrowers better deals on loans, but that's because the cost of lending is going up, so this will yield lower returns for people's savings, and that's going to have a rippling effect across all markets. This is going to hurt most people, but the people hurt the most will be the hodlers of these ultimate shit coins from traditional markets. Now, there was another piece of news given, and uh, the Fed is going to cut short its attempt to lower their balance sheet of government bonds. In October of last year, the Fed attempted to implement this plan uh, to limit their government bonds, and uh, now they're having to call it quits. So quantitative easing, this was quantitative tightening. Okay, since the announcement of the rate drop, major markets like the S&P 500, Dow Jones, and NASDAQ have been in free fall. Everyone is saying the housing market will shrug this off, but there's still a lot of uncertainty when this might just be the first rate cut of this year. Fed Chair Jerome Powell said, quote, It's not the beginning of a long series of rate cuts, but I didn't say it's just one. What we are seeing is that it's, a, it's appropriate to adjust policy to a somewhat more accommodative stance over time, and that's how we're looking at it, close quote. All of this is meant to taper expectations of growth since we've seen increased tensions in global trade deals and all of these markets are highly volatile to these political no negotiations china's market china's markets were reeling like all others from this news and they took control of the yuan, of the yuan and set the price of the dollar at around seven yuan trump's bombastic twitter rant policy threw a spotlight on the issue monday when he tweeted quote china dropped the price of their currency to an almost historic low it's called currency manipulation. Are you listening, Federal Reserve? This is a major violation which will greatly weaken China over time. Close quote. And Trump has been wanting to see these interest rate cuts for a while now, but this cut was not enough for his liking. He also tweeted after this announcement saying, quote, What the market wanted to hear from Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve was that this was the beginning of a lengthy and aggressive rate cutting style which would keep pace with China as usual, Powell let us down, close quote. 
And while Trump is upset to not see the level of cuts he wanted, like Jerome was saying earlier, this isn't the only cut. Chief economist at PGIM Nathan Sheets said, quote, the Fed is broadly comfortable with the way the economy is performing, but they are worried about risk and inflation. They are thinking, you know, maybe another one later in this year, maybe two over the next year or so, close quote. So it's likely we'll see more cuts here in the near future. All of this change in policy at the Fed is representative of a recent sea change, according to St. Louis Fed President James Bullard. We know Janet Yellen is out and Powell is in, but what other changes are going on here? Let's see. Uh, I'm sorry. This is crazy trying to manipulate through my notes right here. Bullard had this to say about the cuts, quote, while additional policy action may be desirable, the long and variable lags in the, F in the effects of monetary policy suggest that the effect of previous actions are only now being beginning to impact macroeconomic outcomes. And that, quote, the bottom line is that U.S. monetary policy is considerably more accommodative today than it was as of late last year, close quote. So all of this looks uh, really good for Bitcoin. I mean, it highlights problems in our monetary policy and shows how other cap controls controls. It shows how other capital controls are used in the system. It also shows the weakness of markets to political sentiment with all of these bad trade deals. And yeah, it makes the apolitical nature of Bitcoin settlement seem very attractive. Bitcoin also looks like a great hedge in this current global economic climate. Like we are saying, this news is having effects far and wide. We've already seen the European Central Bank planning to continue their path of negative interest rates, which is having its own impact on the German bond market. At the same time, we are seeing countries who operate outside of these banking cartels talk about using other means of economic settlement. Without a doubt, the times are tumultuous and it's going to be a while before we see the full impact of these recent moves from the Fed. We should be ready as a community to onboard a whole new series of people who are waking up to these economic realities. I mean, I wasn't in Bitcoin when Cyprus happened, but I've met a lot of people who came over because of that situation. And this could be a similar story, but with a much larger crowd. All right, so yeah, what do you guys think about uh, all this talk about Bitcoin? I know you guys were taken back a little bit seeing Kazakhstan accept Bitcoin for weapons. What are you guys going to do when we start seeing macroeconomics settle on Bitcoin, like, you know, the big players nowadays using Bitcoin? Maybe. I mean, it definitely looks a little bit better than this current situation. Well, I mean... Like these kind of systemic problems coming home to roost is a long time coming, and <laughs> I mean that that's not just happening in a vacuum either. I mean there are a lot of politically tense situations uh, coinciding with a lot of environments going through these, you know, economic changes with interest rates being uh, adjusted and targeted around for different reasons that ultimately boil down to again circling back to politics i mean you know for a while during the whole 2017 bull market and afterwards i mean like there was a pretty decent period of correlation with legacy markets in bitcoin and a lot of people were looking at that as you know, kind of a big question mark over the whole thesis of, of Bitcoin as the, the hedge uh, against legacy markets as something uncorrelated with it. And, you know, the, this kind of general global situation going on right now is really, I think, going to be the first full scale test uh, of how Bitcoin is going to function. Like, is it going to fall into a correlation with legacy markets or is it going to function as that hedge? And, you know, it's, I, I'm really confident that it will, but it's ultimately like this is going to be kind of a make or break moment as far as Bitcoin's utility actually delivering on, on the promises in that regard. I really like the way that you're going there. Uh, Shinobi, because I have been thinking about the same thing recently. So what 
what Rick brought up is that while well, we have huge problems in our current financial system, and now you are bringing up, okay, but is Bitcoin is going to be ready for, for that? And I have been thinking about that and I actually wrote a blog post, it's called The Quest for the Perfect Bitcoin Wallet. It came from the thing that I was, I was thinking about, oh, how can we make Wasabi uh, more user-friendly for grandma and things like that. And I came to the conclusion we can't it just, there are, it's always going to be a niche. There are just so, so many things that you, we cannot compromise on uh, because of privacy. Now, so what can we do then, not with Wasabi, but, but as the Bitcoin ecosystem to get ready for the, for the, the current financial system is, there is going to be a, a fi another financial crisis. I don't think anyone debates that. The debate is only about when it's going to be. Uh, okay, so when it is going to be, then only alternative is going to be Bitcoin. Now, how do we make Bitcoin ready for that? And what what was our answer so far? <laughs> Our answer, not as a collective, but whoever tried to solve this problem, the answer was Coinbase, Circle. Oh, do you remember Circle? Circle was, everyone was so excited. This is going to be the apple of Bitcoin. <laughs> it's going to make Bitcoin easy. But what, what's the problem with this kind of attempts to make Bitcoin easy? Is that it is compromising on on very fundamental private, very fundamental principles of Bitcoin, like privacy and uh, I don't know. There are some principles I I, I listed there uh, uh, because they are ah oh, custod of course custodial. That's the big problem. Now, so what what can we do? We need a Bitcoin wallet that can't do basically anything uh, only to receive and send money maybe show some history i'm not even sure fee estimation is needed there always block targets three or something like that uh, you need a bitcoin wallet that's super easy to use and translated to every language it has to be on mobile it has to have a desktop part the desktop part has to actually connect to hardware wallet which should be also super easy to use and then the desktop part has to run a bitcoin full node because this huge project has to take responsibility of the network because i don't think i have to explain why so it should be easy to run a bitcoin full node on the desktop part and the other thing is a lightning hub should be easy to run too uh, Tor is obviously needed or some kind of anonymity network, probably Tor, because everyone's using that and that's the and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so Lightning Network Hub on the desktop and, and of course Lightning Network because Bitcoin doesn't scale. So we have to have something that no actually able to handle the influx of users and, and this no is power. going to be the end of it. Yes. I hate to tell you, but if the global economy implodes next year, people rush into Bitcoin, um, everybody's going to be using it through things like Coinbase and Square Cash. And that's just what would happen. Like you can't, exactly. you can't build that simple wallet you're talking about any other way. Exactly. That's my point, that we could at least attempt to make Bitcoin usable in a way that grandma would understand it and still grandma would hold the keys or rather the hardware wallet and still grandma would have some kind of privacy like two of two coin joints at least that, that wouldn't prevent grandma from losing her privacy, that, but that just simple two of two coin joints would actually prevent effective mass surveillance 
uh, if this would be widely adopted. So individual privacy, I think it can be with Bitcoin, with the current Bitcoin individual privacy, only with the Lightning Network, but on chain it can't be saved. It, it just can't be saved in a user, in a really grandma friendly way. Not normal user, but grandma, like the really the, the less less technical user. It, I, I, I don't see any way to, to save save individual privacy, only the to, to fuck the mass surveillance. Uh, that's that's what we can we can aim for, and this kind of makes me sad actually. But but that's 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 how it is. That's the practical reality of the situation. Well, that's where I hope, man. It's not going to be next year. I mean, I'm hoping you know that this thing is going to move away from the brink because it does feel like you know this thing can happen at any moment. Like this, you know, this da economic downturn of where you know. Correction should have been made back in 08 and they weren't and um, yeah, it's a uh, it's kind of a race to get a lot of development done to see if we can be ready because there will be a moment and I'm sure we'll still think we're not ready, but um, we'll find our way through it. Yeah, let's uh, let's keep moving. We got just a couple more stories. Uh, Janine yours was kind of in this uh, vein about um, interest rates and everything, right? Yeah, it's very similar. Um, and it's not, as you know, Rick was talking about, it's not really a Bitcoin story, but I think it is an effect because it may result in uh, some significant percentage of wealthy people, specifically wealthy Swiss people, to either move their money into more local banks or to diversify maybe into Bitcoin if they haven't already. And that's because the uh, UBS Group AG uh, is reportedly going to start charging Swiss clients an annual fee of 0.6% on deposits of more than 500,000 euros, which is about $560,000. Um, and the reason that's significant is because that fee previously only kicked in at 1 million euros, and so they've now cut it down to 500,000 as the limit. Um, and then UBS competitors like Credit Suisse uh, Group and Julius Baer um, are also moving in a similar direction, though in the case of Julius Baer, they claim that their strategy is to selectively impose that fee on a case-by-case -case basis, factoring in uh, which currency is being deposited. But, but nonetheless, they are reporting that their customers are withdrawing their cash already in response to these fee changes. Um, Julius Baer, not UBS, I don't think they said anything about that yet. Um, but uh, Bloomberg, this all comes from an article by Bloomberg reporter Patrick Winters, and um, in it he wrote, like Swiss rival Chris, uh, Chris, Credit Swiss Group AG, UBS is caught between the prospect of losing money to hold client deposits and imposing fees that could prompt customers to take their business elsewhere. Amid an extended period of ultra-low and negative interest rates, the lenders have to pay central banks to park excess cash in Swiss francs or euros. And so they also note that if clients want to avoid this fee, they can move cash into fiduciary call deposits outside of Switzerland, um, which can be apparently accomplished in two working days. And then the deposit would only be subject to a 0.375% annual fee, um, which may still be significant for some people, but obviously that cuts in half, so they would prefer that. And... They can also maybe avoid it by moving into local cantonal banks because those are supported by the regional governments in Switzerland and they apparently don't pass on negative interest rates to customers. So that's a couple of strategies. Obviously, the third strategy is to go into Bitcoin and you don't have any of this nonsense. Um, but the reason that this, I think, is particularly significant is because, I mean, I, I think a bunch of banks around the world are going to do this at some point and are already considering it for some time. But regarding Switzerland, um, most people will see the um, 500,000 euros limit and think, you know, that's who cares? That's a very small amount of people. They have a ton of money. 
Um, but actually, if you know anything about Switzerland, um, it has the highest per capita concentration of millionaires in the world, uh, twice as much as the United States, uh, with more than 700,000 people um, who are millionaires. Uh, the U.S. still has more millionaires in aggregate. I think it's like 13, 14 million or something. Uh, but per capita, Switzerland has twice as many. And so, you know, if you're walking down the street, uh, about one in 11 people that you'll pass will probably be a millionaire, uh, which is like 12% of the population. So uh, this fee policy change is basically going to be affecting uh, more than that because it's at now it's at the 500,000 euro limit. And so that's going to be easily more than a tenth of the population and that's not going to be without consequences so yeah some things might start happening they fucked up they tried to go negative before they closed off all the release valves yeah yeah in comes the hyper bitcoinization then i mean for sure it's like I mean, what are you going to do in times like, like we're saying, there's just so much going on with like people's ability to just try and hold on to what value they have and try and trust some system that's not going to be manipulated to where their value will get lost. I mean, yeah, it's hard not to look at Bitcoin with, I mean, you know, I'm sure a bunch of people, I mean, like even I've got uncles that, you know, they looked at Bitcoin a long time ago and laughed and now they're looking at it with some more serious eyes because... I mean, the situation, is you can't look at it and say, like, oh, everything's going to be all right. Everybody knows something's going to happen bad. Yeah, I, I, I hope I'm not misattributing it, but I think it was a tweet by Jameson Lopp recently where he said that there are three stages of, I don't know, he said three stages that, like, family members and friends who are not Bitcoiners around you go through. The first step is where they mock you for evangelizing Bitcoin. The second step is I actually can't remember the second step. I don't know if anyone wants to pull that up really quick. But the third step was they um, they are angry at you for not persuading not persuading them enough to get involved in Bitcoin. I'm gonna look it up really quick because it was funny. Delivery fail. But um. No, I was looking it up too. I can't find it. See. Well, here, look, I got this really relevant one pulled up. It's uh, it's something that Jack posted earlier. Jack Mallers posted earlier today. It says, as older monetary systems be begin a systematic systemic collapse, natively digital programmable money grows its rich feature set and value every day. If you can observe what's happening, you realize how lucky you are to be alive and a part of such a beautiful time for humanity. And then it's a fingers crossed and a prayer and hands together because, yeah, I mean, it's a crazy time. Yeah, go ahead with that one. Yeah, so I found it. I think he tweeted it yesterday. He says, Bitcoin hodl stages. Your family or your friends and family are annoyed that you won't stop evangelizing Bitcoin. Two, your friends and family are glad they didn't listen to you because Bitcoin crashed. Three, your friends and family are upset that you didn't do a better job convincing them to adopt Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's where it's like even yeah some of my you know holdouts in my family they're they're like calling me now they're like okay what is going on because this stuff doesn't make sense with what we're doing. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys want to exit the world of global macroeconomic markets and quantitative easing and tightening and all that. Let's get into Woo! a little update, a little update on what's going on. All right. Let's catch up on a couple of countries and where they are standing with their current regulatory conditions. First up is Iran. And we've been covering their growing interest in the space and their attempts to properly regulate it. Last we talked about the this situation was in episode 182, where we discussed the recent spike in energy consumption and more miners being seized who were using unregulated power sources. Well, the news for today is a recent bill was ratified by the Iranian cabinet that covers the topic of mining and cryptocurrencies. 
The first major bit from the bill is that trading any cryptocurrencies within the country of Iran is considered not lawful, and they do not view digital assets as legal tender. That language stops really short of labeling anything illegal, and it doesn't sound like too much to worry about, just a measure in place to try and control the development of the space. The bigger part of the bill discusses mining and how it should be carried out. It says, quote, or not really quote, but these are the things that you should be doing. Mining cryptocurrencies will be allowed inside Iran under certain conditions. Miners need approval from Iran's industry ministry, and you're not allowed to mine inside a 30 kilometer boundary of all provincial centers, except for Tehran and the central city of Esfahan, where uh, tougher restrictions apply to get the certification to start mining. And mining farms should be charged for the electricity or the natural gas used to generate electricity based on prices applied for the export of energy. And lastly, mining farms will be taxed like industrial manufacturing units unless the owner returns the money earned from the export of their digital currencies back into Iran's economic cycle. So it sounds like they're encouraging mined bitcoins or cryptocurrencies to stay there in Iran. And uh, yeah, that's as far as what's out of Iran. I think this is pretty good news for them. It's nothing too harsh and it sounds like a reasonable approach to try and encourage development. I'm sure those who are working there in the industry are going to, you know, appreciate the clarity. But uh, I don't know. The It's possible the language could change before that before this actually becomes law. Do you guys have any quick comment on this one? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of uh, interesting. It's taking like the China playbook, like kind of trying to clamp down on most of it, but still allow the ecosystem to function in some way to reap a benefit from. Yeah, it definitely feels like that slow growth approach. Like, let's just stem where this stuff is at and make sure we control where it's coming from and then we know what we're doing. And so it seems like a smart approach. But let's keep moving on. This is just one more little update. This is going to be out of Thailand, and it's really just a little warning. We might see some increased AML measures in that country. This news comes to us from the Bangkok Post in their interview with Acting Secretary General of the Anti-Money Laundering Office, General Precha, and... And... I'm sorry. So, yeah, I just posted that name in there. Do you guys know how to say that? Okay. General Precha Charasanshayana. I'm that... I, I'm really just offended this guy. I'm sorry, General. Cheryl the 20th and Sahayana. The, you're probably correct. You're probably more accurate than I am. So anyway, this guy's uh, running this office of the AMLO, and the 20th of this month marks the 20th anniversary of that office, and the general was asked about his vision for the road ahead. And uh, he sees cryptocurrency as a challenge as it, quote, will be a tool of new money laundering, close quote. And he believes criminal suspects will transform their money into digital currencies such as bitcoins as the virtual format will make it harder for authorities to trace their money. And then the general says that, quote, that's why we are amending our laws to prepare us for new online missions, close quote. And the first target of these amendments is the uh, Money Laundering Act, where he wants to add a section requiring cryptocurrency exchanges to report activities to the AML, ALMO. And uh, yeah, this office usually sticks to traditional sector, but they will now be probing these uh, exchanges and darknet markets in order to fall within international standards. So it sounds like, um, you know, they're trying to move towards uh, appeasing the FATF. So while they might be moving in this direction, General Precha said he prefers to see AMLO become more cautious to avoid facing counter lawsuits lodged by suspects. So these amendments haven't been passed yet, and it's a topic that we're going to have to keep watching as the situation develops. I know Thailand is a place for many digital nomads out there. Just uh, keep your ear to the ground on this one, too. And uh, yeah, that does, about does this for updates. So... That's about it. So, no, Para. Um, do you want to laugh first, or should I? 
<laughs> I I laugh first, then you laugh, then I laugh again. Uh, my first story is that uh, when I was in Thailand and I was doing the digest, I was smoking an electric cigarette and and you know that's illegal in Thailand yet people are doing it that's that's the less interesting story and now it's your turn well um i didn't really see any kind of law of any sort actually enforced at any time i was there so <laughs> good luck <laughs> Yeah, that's the case with some of these countries. It's like, let's see if they'll enforce anything. So, yeah, I mean, you know, as I was reading the story, that's where I was like, you know, we're just going to have to watch this. I'm sure, you know, they're talking the talk to try and appease the FATF and the and the uh, Bank of International Settlements. But I don't know how much like actual enforcement we'll see from this stuff. Back back to the enforcement stuff that Shinobi is talking about. A great I just looked it up. Since 1960, prostitution, prostitution is illegal in Thailand, yet it's everywhere. But a couple of years ago, they, I think I told this story already, but anyway, a couple of years ago, people, uh, they, they figured out, hey, uh, if it's illegal already, we should calm down on this. Okay, what should we do about this? Well, let's let, let, okay, let's do some family-friendly zones when where they are where post- prostitution is illegal. Uh, it was illegal before that or anywhere else. But anyway, now it's it's really illegal there. And what was the response of the girls? <laughs> it's like they created their own family-friendly zones where they <laughs> dressed like <laughs> little girls. <laughs> wow. So that's about enforcement in Thailand. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like they got some ingenious ways around that. Shinobi, you got any more crazy tales of Thailand? Good luck. <laughs> now, one thing that I was able to enforce in Thailand is that Shinobi to put down the toilet top. Because I told him that there are snakes that are coming out of that and you don't want to <laughs> it. You were scared of snakes coming out of the toilet. So Giant enforcement pussy. in Thailand is not that bad. <laughs> the impossible is possible. <laughs> All right. Well, I yeah. guess, I don't know. Final thoughts about that time? You want to take us in, Rick? Yeah, man, I got a final thought, except it's nothing to really type or say. Any, just that I started eating meat again. I like eating meat on a regular basis now. Every day I'm cooking up something. Yeah, man. I mean, I've been a vegetarian for two and a half years. And, you know, it was like somebody brought it to my attention. And I just like I couldn't resist a uh, double bacon burger with no bun. And I ate that thing. And uh, next thing you know, I'm eating pork sausages and New York stick straight steak strips and T-bones like I'm trying to yeah it's like man a real 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 noticeable difference in like my ability to you know can keep going as far as like working out I used to only work out like once or twice a day where now it's like since I started eating this meat it's like every free minute I got I'm working out it just about feels like so yeah, my final thought is uh, if you've been a vegetarian for a while and you've been thinking about getting back into meat, man, it's tasty and it's it's something that uh, invigorates you, man. You get strong again. Yeah, so my final work. thought is that it 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 looks like you you take advice from Zuko on vegetarianism. No, <laughs> you took <laughs> advice from know. Mr. Hoddle, who's who's fucking woke. Yeah, that's it. Nah, Zoku doesn't. He does not. Nah, he doesn't know what's going on with his diet either. So, but I mean, as far as like you know, sticking with one of these things, I think it's good now that I'm not like if somebody asks, "Am I on some diet?" I'm like, "No, I can eat meat. I can eat vegetables. I can eat whatever I want." 
But for the most part, I do still stay away from carbs and sugars. Those things are just like toxic, man, like reality. <laughs> mm -hmm. All, All right. right. Any final thoughts? No par, you first. <laughs> uh, this this was my final thought. No, that's not a final thought. Asking somebody else if they have a final thought is not a final thought. Give a final thought. <laughs> I I don't have any. Janine. Oh bugger you all. Alrighty. Well Do you no, have I one? Don't. Um shit. Uh this is, Baba Booey, Baba Booey, uh BSV is the real Bitcoin. <laughs>